Well, howdy YouTube family. It is Bolt CRNA coming to you with another week's topic. This week we're gonna be talking about did I hate being a nurse? So today we're gonna to talk about it a little bit more in depth. Let's get into spilling the tea today. So me personally, what my experience was as a nurse, I felt like I was respected 95% of the time. I felt like I had a good level of autonomy as an ICU nurse. I felt like people respected me, people on the clinical you know, treatment team respected me, and the patients respected me, and I enjoyed what I did. Uh, there was very few times that I came into work and thought, I don't wanna be here, I don't feel respected, I don't feel like I have a role that I wanna do, and I wanna leave. Uh, towards the end of my career, like towards the end of the four years, I was getting more and more like that, but not because of anything had actually shifted and changed in my day-to-day -day life, but I think I was just reaching a point in my career and my uh, advancement that I was ready for that next step, and I knew I was ready for the next step, and I was kind of ready to shut the old chapter in my life that I was finished with and start the next thing. But it wasn't because anything had changed with people around me, I think it was just me personally. So you notice I did say 95% of the time I felt respect and autonomy. There was about 5% of the time that I had a physician be rude to me or dismissive or say something along the lines of, because I said so, you should be doing this, or someone um, didn't want to get, uh, like, for instance, I'm thinking of a time where a patient was to get a procedure at the bedside and the patient was uh, not really totally conscious, had fresh extubated, not really aware of what was going on. They were kind of still sedated and out of it. The family member was Spanish speaking, did not understand what was going on, very nervous to have this bedside procedure done, didn't, didn't really understand the risks or benefits or anything about the procedure. And the, the um, proceduralist was wanting to continue on right away and it pretty much handed me the consent form and told me to go to the patient, his family member who was coherent and acting as the power of attorney and get them to sign the form and I refused. And this person got very upset. This person was uh, well known on the unit to be kind of, um, I think he was like the medical director for the hospital actually. So he was, he was an influential person at this facility and I think he was used to getting his way and, and pushing and he insisted that he had explained it to them and it, it was their own it was their own lack of intelligence which he cannot help with if they still don't understand it after he explained it and therefore I should just have them sign this consent form and he's gonna do the procedure in an hour and I need to get stuff ready for him to do the procedure and I refused on all parts of that and insisted that he speak to the patient again he ended up sending one of his residents one of the senior residents into the room to explain it to them again and then with a Spanish interpreter and them appropriately understanding and then they signed the consent form and then but he was very upset with me and was kind of dismissive and rude to me for the rest of the time that I worked at that facility around him. So there are instances where things do happen like that as a nurse and you don't really have a lot of recourse for that. You can go to management, you can tell other people, you know, he's being kind of rude or dismissive or uncomfortable around you, but uh, that no, nothing's really going to happen to be honest. It, they will almost always side with the provider in those types of instances. Another interesting facet about this autonomy thing and respect in the nursing field is, like I mentioned, it's mostly female dominant. I find that women get much less respect in the nursing field and it's really messed up and my friends that I worked alongside, I could watch a female nurse suggest something to the treatment team or, you know, try and be involved or expect a certain level of respect back from someone and they just don't offer it back to them. And then I can see a male who, you know, comes in as a male nurse and says something differently and then this person gets a very different type of reaction from that same person. And especially people who come from different backgrounds and cultures outside of America, uh, maybe where their culture where they were raised, women especially didn't speak up or did not have much role, you know, amongst men. Those types of people from those diverse backgrounds, I find really had a hard time in American healthcare with a lot of female nurses trying to voice their opinion in rounds or push back on a certain order or anything like that. There was there, and sometimes they could they could raise their their voice and they could get very aggressive. I'm not saying that disrespect does not exist in the nursing world just because 95% of the time I felt respected. I definitely will recognize and admit that women 
and especially women of color, deal with a lot of inappropriate disrespect. Something else about being a nurse is, as far as respect goes, the family can, the, the doctors can round, especially in the ICU, there'll be doctors and providers that round a lot in the mornings and then they'll go about their day and they'll go see people in the clinic or they'll go, to the, go do surgeries or whatever they have to do for the rest of the day, then they'll go home. Uh, the rest of that day, you are with that family in that patient. So they will, different family members will cycle in and different specialists may drop by and add additional little blurbs to the treatment plan. And so you are essentially the person who will have to synthesize all this data and try and keep the family or the patient, if they're coherent, uh, aware of like exactly who's saying what, why this person's doing this. You kind of are the um, connector and the networker for all the providers and the patients. And so the patients will ask you very often and their family members who will cycle in will ask you very often to explain to them, you know, what, what do they say or what's the new plan and you'll tell them. Uh, and then there are multiple times where the families will say, well, when's the doctor coming in? So even though you're explaining it to them in detail of exactly what's going on, what the, what the doctor said earlier when they were here, they kind of want the doctor to come in and tell them themselves again, which is unlikely to happen, but that's their, that their idea is like, maybe you don't know what you're saying and maybe you don't, who, who knows? Maybe you're actually just regurgitating something the doctor said and you don't even know the details of what they're saying. But uh, that is just an element of that kind of role you're gonna be in where you will have what you're saying questioned a lot more versus what the doctor would have said. Another thing the families will often do, at least they did with me, and I, I feel like I've seen this with other nurses too, they'll say, um, so when are you going to med school? Or are you in med school? Or uh, are you training to be a doctor yet? Uh, and they kind of get upset or even dismiss the idea that you're happy or content in your role as being a nurse. And, and in that way, it can be disrespectful. It can feel like they're dismissing your current education and your current abilities and your current skill and, and everything that you're doing to keep their loved one alive and uh, the, you know, the critical thinking that you're doing every day for their families. It's kind of like, oh, that's not really important or relevant or, or um, useful, uh, but all that's useful is if you're training to go do a different role. Now, something that you do have, especially as an ICU nurse that I did like, when it comes to respect and autonomy is the ability to titrate drugs. Now the ICU is gonna be the most autonomous place that you're gonna be able to work as a nurse, which is why you have to be an ICU nurse before they allow you to apply to CRNA school. They want you to have that critical thinking ability. They want you to have that high level of autonomy so that you'll have that baseline education so you can begin your anesthesia training. And by the autonomy in the ICU, I'll tell you in detail in case you don't, are not an ICU nurse, uh, you can titrate medications in the ICU. So there'll be a handful of drugs, you know, 15, 20 different drugs maybe that you titrate on a typical basis in the ICU. And there'll always be protocols of like between this range and this range and based off of like these kinds of findings. But after a time of being an ICU nurse, you know the appropriate ranges of what's to titrate between and you know the proper indications for when you should and should not be titrating. So you'll oftentimes just as a reflex be like, you see this blood pressure doing this, you're gonna titrate this down. You're gonna titrate that up. You need to check the blood sugar and titrate the insulin drip down. You need to you know change drugs and, and infusions and things and then you'll see the reaction within your patient and then you'll know you either need to go up on that or down on this. And so it's a constant back and forth. And, and so you're using pharmacology and you're using these drugs and these machines and um, all this uh, stuff to help manage patients who are critically ill. So I found that that level of autonomy was awesome and I really enjoyed that. Another thing about autonomy in the ICU is there, there'll be a lot of standing orders. So it depends on your facility actually, but I'll just tell you as a new grad where I worked at a regional hospital in Alabama, there was no med school, there was no residency, there was no, there was none of those types of providers in the facilities. There was only the attending physician uh, who would, you know, have clinic and other things they had to do throughout the day. They were, they were not staying on unit. There were no providers that stayed stationed on unit. The only people who stayed on unit were the, the nurses. And, uh, and so they were all RNs on, in the ICU. And so all of us could hang blood, respond to rapid responses, 
uh, start new drips. We had about 15 drips that we had standing orders to start if we needed to, like amiodarone, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin, things like that. Now, more commonly now, and at other bigger hospitals when I went travel nursing, I found that there would be nurse practitioners or PAs uh, or residents who would be stationed in the ICU and they would pretty much fill in on that role. Like they would be your sounding board if the patient went into SVT all of a sudden, they would be the ones who would say, hey, let's start amiodarone and hey, I'll put this order in the computer and hey, because they had ordering abilities. But where I was at for two years as a new grad in the ICU, there was none of those people. Uh, so it was just us. Um, so yeah, you had a lot of autonomy as, as an ICU nurse at some hospital. Now, I did go travel nursing. I did tr go and work at some academic hospitals. And I can just tell you from my personal experience, the autonomy levels and the ability to kind of critical think and make decisions on your own varies a whole lot from hospital to hospital uh, in the ICU. So anytime you have academic hospitals that have med students and residents and, you know, five NPs on staff and, you know, all these different types of providers, you are not gonna have that kind of level of autonomy and ability to do those things because you don't need to because there's ordering providers who are constantly available, especially in a teaching facility. You're actually, if you did have that ability to do those things, you'd actually be stealing the learning process from those students who are training and learning. They need to be able to see the SVT and they need to be able to say, hey, we need to do amiodarone and they need to know how to put the order in and that's part of their training. Well, all right guys, that was all the aspects of being an RN that I find rewarding, the pros of them that I liked, some of the negatives about them that I liked, salary, autonomy, pay, those aspects seem to be like the highlight reel of what it is to be an RN. And what maybe I miss a little bit about it and also things that I really don't miss about it. So the TLDR of do did I hate being an RN? No. The answer is no, I did not hate being an RN. I enjoyed my four years of being an RN in the ICU. I don't know that I would have enjoyed being an RN any department outside of the ICU, to be honest. Uh, from all the different areas that I've seen outside of the ICU, I think that I would not enjoy that because the difference in the level of autonomy and the critical thinking that you're allowed to do in those other areas, uh, I think that would bother me because I, I got used to that level of autonomy in the ICU. So in that aspect, if you ask me to go be like an RN on an oncology floor uh, or a tele floor or something like that, managing four, five, six patients, uh, yeah, I would probably tell you I, I would have hated that. Um, but yeah, one or two patients, critically ill, I got to critical think, got paid well, got to do travel nursing. I loved my time as an RN. And that is your answer. So if you guys are looking for mock interviews or strategy sessions to get yourself ready to go to CRNA school, if you're interested in that career, follow the link below. I'm gonna try and plug it down there. It's my Calendly link so you can link up a book time with me and do a Zoom session with me. Uh, it's also on my Instagram page. Go follow me on Instagram. I'm most active over there. You guys have noticed that I don't post here every day anymore. Uh, YouTube, it takes a lot of time and editing and process out of my life to do this stuff. So uh, the videos come a little more sporadically now. But TikTok and Instagram, I'm Bolt CRNA over there. Follow me over there. Join the memberships. I've got the study guide for you over there. I do an exclusive behind the scenes video every month for you members over there. And I also do shout outs for the Ketamine Kings every month uh, if you join that level too. Make sure and hit that like button. Subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And until next time, that's Bolt out.